at IMTS in Chicago, I spoke to Peter Lutz of the OPC Foundation about FLC, field level control, right? He explained that PLC supporting FLC will have to include an OPC UA client to configure the other controller or device when they release that specification. I asked him that since so few PLCs implement an OPC UA client over 16 years after the general specification was released, what would convince the OEMs to add an OPC UA client now to support the FLC initiative? So everyone has, there's a basic premise that we all have to agree on, okay? And that's this premise. If OPC UA, if OPC UA is the standard through which interoperability can be achieved, why hasn't it been widely adopted? One of the things that I really want to do, I'd love to do this, fund it myself. It would probably cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I would love to do a study, a market study on that does a corollary and a contrast between um, all of the elements in the OPC UA standard in the specification and all of the available products that exist in the market with those capabilities. I'd love to do like a heat map and basically do a matrix of each element in the OPC standard and then basically do a heat map as to which ones exist, right? Which information models are being leveraged, right? Et cetera. What, how many of the companion specs are actually being used? And I'll guarantee you, I guarantee you, guarantee you, guarantee you, more than half of the OPC uh, specification has no implementation, not little or single or few, but no examples of it being implemented, more than half. So we have, we have to accept the premise right now in order for this conversation to make sense that the market has told us OPC UA is not the mechanism through which interoperability will be achieved. And the reason why is exactly what Matt just said there. 16 years after the spec, 16 years, 16 years, we do not see wide adoption. Why? And why is it that more than half the spec hasn't been implemented at all anywhere in any product? And I, and, he, and I don't have data to support that. That's me speculating, but it's, in, it's anecdotal based on my knowledge, but I'll bet you it's accurate. But I, I would have to fund a study in order to prove it, okay? Um, Matt, the, what Matt finished his comment, he said, Peter's response was that the use case didn't exist before and that the market will pressure PLC OEMs to add this capability. So the argument that Peter said is, even though we wrote this 16 years ago, nobody's been wanting to serve out the entire information model, okay, from a PLC. That's essentially why you would put an OPC server on board so that you could basically browse the entire information model and you could consume it at, at will. Okay, that, it, that would be the use case, right? Now, when we start talking about time-sensitive networking, so you guys see it abbreviated as TSN, but when we start talking about TSN, which is in a nutshell, TSN, all TSN is, is Ethernet with a determinism. That is, we guarantee that the message was received and we know exactly who received it. That's all, that's all that really TSN really means. It puts in a bunch of mechanisms in there to make sure that you're prioritizing time-sensitive time information and that messages are received in the proper order and all that kind of stuff. But for the lay person, TSN really is Ethernet with determinism. We're guaranteed the message was received and it, and it was received by the person we wanted to send it to. Okay, that's all, that's all that really is in, the lay, in, in layman's terms. He's arguing that the use case hasn't existed until now for browsing entire namespaces, which simply isn't true. Do you wanna know why? Well, MQTT was created in the late 90s, right around the time when TCP was winning the protocol wars. MQTT was created so that you could build those browsable namespaces. A gap in the market already existed in the late 90s for this piece. Now, that wasn't the primary, the big reason was, how do I send data points? MQTT was really initially designed, how do I send data over wire, over the wire when I have very limited, limited bandwidth? And how can I send oil and gas telemetry data at a much higher frequency 
than pulling it every 15 minutes or every once per hour. Like that was really the, the solution. And the answer was, let's create a stateful protocol that's edge driven and report by exception. And if we're only reporting by exception and we're pushing the message, we never have to request for the message, then we can eliminate so much of the consumption of the bandwidth. And then same thing like with the header. Let's keep the header really, really small. Let's not send a lot of definition information when we're instantiating that connection. Let's not send a lot of, you know, and I'm going to go over this list from another member of the community about the limitations of MQTT here in a second. Um, a lot of the limitations he points out are only limitations if you if you want your protocol to be something more like OPC, okay? Um, but Peter's argument that the use case for wanting to browse namespaces in smart things didn't exist until now and it didn't exist 16 years ago is just patently false. It's patently false. The unified namespace architecture that I created was first implemented in a fucking salt mine in 2005. Why? Because there was a gap in existing um, technology that made that possible. Like I had to create my own because it didn't exist. There is another reason it's not being widely adopted. Okay. And there are actually, there's many reasons. Okay. And not the least of which is the, the, the fundamental problems with the OPC foundation. The, the organization itself. Okay. Uh, so Matt said at ACOS, what are your thoughts that PLCs will have to embed an OPC UA client to connect to other devices for FLC? Okay. And JS, um, uh, he, I know who this is, but I, I don't know if he wants us to actually use his full name. So I'm just going to use JS. One of the smart, you know, uh, I love Matt and, and, JS's exchanges in the Discord server. If you want to see great conversations, but JS really hits, you know, hits the nail on the head here. He says, so I know this question is directed to Akos, but I'd like to chime in. So outside of a few of the PLC makers that are big on machine to machine over OPC UA. Okay. So think uh, for those of you who do like industrial, you know, um, process control, think, um, you know, produce consume tags in Rockwell controllers. So you know how you, you would use a produce, a produce or consumed tag in Rockwell controllers to do controller to controller communication over their native over SIP, right? That you, what he's talking about is outside of a few PLC makers that are big on machine to machine over OPC UA, instead of doing native field bus, you know, the native protocol with produce consume, you're gonna use OPC UA for that, com that communication. He's saying outside of the few PLC makers that are big on that, I don't really see this taking off. The PLC open function block was neat, but few companies wholeheartedly adopted it. Also, not having to map in and out field bus payloads is a pretty good use case, right? So he's making a point. He's saying, Peter, you're wrong, okay? Um, he, so then he puts together a list of arguments here and he says, pretending to be interoperable is the header. And he says, if you look at TSN, which is time sensitive networking, okay, remember what, how I described it, which FLC relies on for determinism. So that and determinism is getting it to the place it's supposed to go and confirming it got there. Okay. Many of the field bus organizations are using TSN to enhance their own competing field bus technologies. Correct. And Matt Paris has a paper coming out that sort of shows how that would happen if you look at the stack, um, the communications uh, protocol and profile, um, you'll, you'll see how where TSN would get inserted in there to do that, okay? But why would one create a new version of a field bus while also participating in working groups to consolidate them? It's a great question. Well, why is it that people create their own field buses? Um, and that's a whole other discussion. I'm not gonna get into it, but, 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 but Really what it boils down to initially is speed and control that I have. I want to have control over the protocol and I want as fast as I possibly can get. Number two, his header is Rockwell doesn't care. <laughs> so if ODVA is working on a TSN implementation of Ethernet IP and ODVA is largely influenced by Rockwell, I'd say largely influenced, I'd say completely controlled by Rockwell. Why would Rockwell bother implementing an OPC UA client with the SIP companion spec? Great question. The answer is they wouldn't. 
Mitsubishi doesn't care is the next header. If CLPA is working on a TSN implementation of CC Link IE, and CLPA is largely influenced by Mitsubishi, and I would make the argument that it's controlled by Mitsu, okay? Why would Mitsubishi bother implementing an OPC UA client with CC Link companion spec? And the answer is they wouldn't be, and that's why they haven't. The next header is Siemens is confused. If Siemens recently enhanced their controller firmware for OPC UA client support, and Pi PI is largely influenced by Siemens, why would PI bother working on a TSN implementation of Profinet? And the answer is they wouldn't. And then he says Fanuc doesn't even bother. That's the next header. If Fanuc or Fanuc, depending upon how you want to um, pronounce it, plans to continue using their range of native protocols, for example, IO Link, SRTP, SNPX, uh, Focus, and support popular field bus protocols like Ethernet, IP, and Profinet, and still not use OPC UA in any of their hardware, why would Fanuc implement an OPC UA client at all? And the answer is they wouldn't. And moreover, Moreover, um, their um, MT Connect is is sort of their shortcut uh, away from having to adopt uh, to deploy OPC UA in their controllers, right? They they've really uh, MT Connect MT Connect adapters for exposing those namespaces is really the direction that Fanuc has gone. All right, Matt Paris responds with before they can tackle um, TSN time sensitive networking. PLCs must embed an OPC UA client to be compliant with FLC controller to controller or the in-progress controller to device spec. At Atcos, do you think this requirement will be too large for PLCs to comply with the FLC specifications? So Atcos gave him a fairly long reply, and I want, I'm going to read the whole thing. He said, I do not think that you can speak of PLCs in general. There are PLCs which use cheap 8-bit processors, and there are PLCs using high-performance x64 architectures. Definitely, there will be PLCs which will not be able to implement this. I would say most, okay? M most uh, mid-level mid and low-level, okay? There are PLCs which cannot implement other high-speed field buses for the same reason. As the cost of compute is getting cheaper, uh, more and more PLCs will be able to implement complex communication mechanisms. I am more worried about TSN plus pub sub than about PLC compute performance. I would be more concerned about PLC compute performance. And here's why. We do enough edge compute projects to understand that there is a very specific threshold for the amount of money you can spend to integrate a dumb um, device on the on the edge. That is, I'm going to use physical wiring to sensors into something smart, and that smart thing is what's going to plug into my infrastructure. Uh, we've done enough of those implementations to know that you have to do everything, engineering, hardware spend, all in for about $800 per node. So for each device I'm going to put on the plant floor, I can't spend more than basically $800, including labor, in order for an organization to say that, that, that we can justify the cost there, okay? That's about the number. Now, for some organizations, the threshold is higher. For some organizations, the threshold is lower. But in general, if you use the $800 number, you're really safe. I mean, like in, it, it works in like 80% of the cases, 90% of the cases, okay? In order, in order to get hit that $800 number, you have to compromise on computational capability. And one of the first things that gets thrown out is any overhead that is non-mission critical. And let me say this, deploying an OPC, you can do this yourself, okay, if you want to, okay? You go ahead and like install Kep server on, your, on a virtual machine, connect a series of devices. You could create simulators if you wanted to, and then set up a couple of, clients that are going to go ahead and pull that server and adjust the polling, re the requests, start out with, I'm requesting once every 60 seconds for data, and then move that down to like one second and watch, watch how the CPU cycle spike. One of the big limitations in OPC is the, the computational overhead required 
to respond to requests is a function of the frequency of the requests. The, the client itself has a lot of control over how much horsepower you need to use in order to respond to messages. That's one of the fundamental, that th this is the, one of the biggest issues I have with OPC UA, the client server architecture, even if I'm using PubSub, okay? Um, he says the current Siemens S7 1500 PLCs can handle 30 parallel incoming OPC UA connections. I did test this and it can run a production line in parallel. But why would an OPC client be a problem? I just laid out why. Because you don't, the, 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 the issue is the frequency at which re requests come in. Okay, there's, you, you literally could, you could spike the CPU. Now, in a, let's say like an Opto 22 would be a really good example where having an onboard OPC server is not a problem because there, it's, it's got two processors. And they're and they're and they're ice completely isolated. One processor is designed just for process control, and the other one is the EPC, the the industrial PC, the IPC, the industrial PC component. All all the overhead associated with non critical applications are in a completely are in a completely separate processor. PLCs aren't generally doing that. Also, he picked the S seven fifteen hundred, which is the Ferrari, right? If you look at the DH445 motion controller, same thing. It's the Ferrari. It's got all the horsepower you could possibly ask for. 